The Spirit of God is with you and also with you. Welcome to Washington Avenue Christian Church. My name is Nathan Russell and my pronouns are he and him. And I serve this congregation as its senior pastor. Truly, it is a good and joyful thing to be with you as we worship God together from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Some quick reminders before worship begins. First, please turn off or silence your cell phones. We are recording this worship experience and it will premiere tonight on YouTube at 6 o'clock. Second, please hold any applause until the very end of worship. And third, Lorain County, we are pulling a new record. We are still green. But if you happen to test positive for COVID-19 after having worshiped in person, we ask that you let the church office know so that we can engage in contact tracing. Thank you for all the ways in which you have leaned into these community covenants and keep one another safe. Leading us in worship today are Brianna Bell, guest musician, Kristen Mayer, worship leader, and Gerald Western, elder at the table. During our time of prayer, I'll mention only the first names of those who are on our prayer list. If you would like to add to our prayer list, there are yellow slips of paper in the pew rags. At the conclusion of worship, take the yellow slips in and put them in the offering box that's near the stairway to the balcony. Throughout the offertory, you may complete a giving envelope. As with your prayer request, place your giving envelopes in the secure box in the narthex. And as a reminder, February is our month to receive contributions for Week of Compassion. Throughout Brianna's offertory, I encourage you to reflect on God's manifold gifts and myriad blessings. When we come to our time of communion, the diaconate will come forward on the last verse of the communion hymn. And then once Brianna begins the communion meditation, you will come forward by the side aisle. A gloved elder, diaconate member, or I will hand you a gluten-free cracker and a cup of juice. And then you will turn to your seats by the center aisle. If someone on your row is differently abled and cannot come forward for communion, we ask that you take one of the pop-top sets that's available at each side. On the back cover of the worship guide is a QR code. You can scan this code with a smart device and a website will open on which you can do three different things. Register your attendance, submit a a prayer request, and give online. Our upcoming events for this week are listed on the last page of the worship guide, but there are so many things to highlight, including right after this uh, worship service, we're going to go downstairs to the Fellowship Hall, and Don Haynes Jr. is going to lead in our next installment of Becoming WACC. So if you are curious about Washington Avenue's journey from Illyria Disciples on 2nd Street to Washington Avenue, go downstairs to learn more. After Don has concluded his presentation, Marty Rowe is going to lead us in a tour of the church, and there's just no telling what we'll uncover, what projects we'll find that need completing, but we hope you will join with us. On Mondays, Uh, Throughout the season of Lent, we are having our Lenten study led by Debbie Walker, Director of Advocacy and Christian Education. And what's so cool about this study is she's going to show children worship and wonder stories throughout the season of Lent. And we're going to get to see those on Zoom and then gather afterward uh, to discuss what we've experienced And what questions make our minds fill with wonder? If you haven't signed up for that, it is not too late. Go to our church website. It will be the very first thing you see. Enter your name and email address, and you will be good to go. As always, our social media accounts are active, so I encourage you to interact with us in multiple ways at W-A-C-C-E-L-Y-R-I-A. 
Beloved of God, today is the first Sunday in Lent. The grace of God redeems our story. May the grace of God find us in this time of worship. Our worship of God is about to begin. So, dear friends, I say to you, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord.
Will you join me in prayer? God, whose grace redeems our story, your love has held us fast. In our time of joy and sorrow, your forgiveness has freed our past. On this first Sunday in our Lenten journey, we ask that you be the author of this instant. Help us love as you have loved us, and forgive without defense. Weave your healing peace and justice throughout our life so that the story we are writing in the present moment becomes one of transformation. We confess that when newness presents itself, we retreat into familiar patterns and antiquated interpretations. And yet, you don't give up on us. In this hour of worship, let us experience your Spirit's work within this congregation so that we may be witnesses to the future you want and ultimately will have. We make this prayer in the name of the one who journeys toward Jerusalem, Jesus the Christ. Amen. just begun our Lenten journeys, a little less than 40 days to go. But you know what's so wondrous about the story that we are writing throughout Lent is that God goes with us. Indeed, God follows us. Or in the words of that 23rd Psalm, God chases after us like uh, Thunder, a German shepherd who is still very much a puppy. But that is what the text states. That surely goodness and mercy shall follow. Actually, it means chase. After all of us. All of us. So confident in this grace that redeems our story. Let us go to God in prayer. And as we do, let us hold these persons deep within our hearts as we speak their names to the very heart of God. Barb, Barb and Rodney, Bill, Bonnie, Brenda, Carol, Wayne and Scott, Chad and Robin, Dennis, Eliza, Aaron, Hank, Jimmy, John and Ava, Josie, Kay, Keith, Kevin, Leslie, Lindsay, Marsha, Mary, Pam, Phyllis and Dick, Ray, Robin and Chad, Rosalie and Jim, Shirley, Vivian, and Wes. We also hold in our deepest sympathies the family and friends of Ashton, the family and friends of Marilyn. Let us go now to God in prayer.
Holy God, we have inherited so many stories. Stories that tell us who we are, where we come from, where we're going, and why we are here. There is a thread throughout all these stories that unites them in a wondrous way. Call it grace. We give you thanks that your grace does indeed follow us all the days of our lives. And we ask that that be so now throughout our Lenten journey. God of all creation, abide with us throughout this life. We remember the ancient stories of creation. In the beginning, when you created the heavens and the earth, and of those first humans, too. We are stewards of your exceedingly beautiful earth, and we ask that you equip and empower us to take care of the earth so that it may flourish and thrive for all generations to come. God of all creation, abide with us throughout this life. We pray for people anywhere and everywhere who are suffering unbelievable strife, whether it's recovery from an earthquake, displacement by war, some, even in our own neighborhoods, live in food deserts, and nutrition is a far-off hope or goal. But you, O oh God, have given us seeds, seeds to plant, and they will grow into something wonderful, maybe even edible too. Seeds that also promote your reign of justice, joy, peace, and shalom. God of all creation, abide with us throughout this life. Hear now, O listening God, all the concerns that we speak to your heart both silently and aloud. In the stillness and the silence, let us sense your spirit that is always at work. God of all creation, Abide with us throughout this life. Okay, here we go, O oh holy God, on this journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem. We know what awaits. That's the cross. But more than that, your resurrecting spirit. May your spirit accompany us and grant us wisdom and redeem our story now and forevermore. And through your spirit, may she give us the breath to sing our prayer to you.
From 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, we hear, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Joy is a byproduct of God-nudged giving. As Paul instructed the Corinthians in the art of generosity, again, he said, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He also noted, whoever sows generously will reap generously. Sometimes we slip cash into the offering plate. Other times we donate online with a worthy ministry or project. Then there are moments when God leads us to respond to the need of a friend with a tangible gift. Maybe a bag of groceries, a tank of gas, or some other kind of gift. Our offering plate this morning represents our gifts, our pledges, our nudges from God, our outreach to others, and also gifts from the saints who came before us here in this congregation through donations to our permanent fund. May we pray? Loving Father, you gave us the gift of your Son, and so we want to give to others. May we respond with your gentle nudge to meet the needs of others. Amen.
a reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, 15 through 17, 21 through 25, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Good luck following along, but listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. The sovereign God crafted the human from the dust of the humus and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living soul. And the sovereign God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there placed the human whom God had formed. Out of the ground, the sovereign God made grow every tree pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life in the middle of the garden, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The sovereign God took the human and settled it in the garden of Eden to till and tend it. Then the sovereign God commanded the human, from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. The sovereign God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and it slept. Then took one of its sides and closed up its place with flesh in place of it. And the sovereign God built the side that had been taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human. Then the human said, This time. This one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called a woman, for out of a man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and his father and clings to his woman, and they shall become one flesh. And they were, the two of them, naked, the woman and her man, and were not ashamed. Now, the serpent had more naked intelligence than any other animal of the field that the sovereign God had made. And it said to the woman, Indeed, did God say, You too shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of any tree in the garden we may eat, Though of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat and shall not touch it, lest you to die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You too will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you too will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her man, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. For the word of God and its promise and covenant. Thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if your grace redeems our story, then nothing else matters. And if your grace does not redeem our story, then nothing else matters. Guide us along the way as we desire wisdom to discern how you are at work within this old world. 
We make this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, our path and pattern. Amen. This week, this past week, has been a consequential one in the life of our Christian faith. No, the Council on Christian Unity didn't meet to initiate a much needed merger, articulation agreements, and reciprocity among mainline Christian traditions. No, there was not a new discovery of an ancient scroll that sets the record straight on some things. Yes, five days ago was Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent. But as important as that day is in our Christian discipleship, that's not the event I have in mind. Rather, on Tuesday, February 21st, 2023, the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States of America, excommunicated the second largest Southern Baptist church in the country from its fellowship. Jared Wellman, the chairman of the Southern Baptist Convention's executive committee said in a statement, and I quote, we found Saddleback Church to be not in friendly cooperation with the convention due to the church continuing to have a female functioning in the office of pastor. Now, let's set the record straight here. The female functioning in the office of pastor is ordained, and her man, her husband, is the lead pastor. The Reverend Stacy Wood is a teaching pastor, and she proclaimed the word of God for the people of God at Saddleback Church as recently as January 22nd, 2023. I guess, you know, a wise woman is just too great a risk for a patriarchal denomination to handle. Therefore, denominational leaders grab what power they can and disaffiliate a congregation. The ordination of women, however, is not new for Southern Baptists. The Watts Street Baptist Church, a Southern Baptist congregation in Durham, North Carolina, ordained Addie Davis, the first woman ordained in 1964. The ordination of the first woman in Southern Baptist life caused a bit of a stir, as we can imagine, and even solicited hate mail from men instructing the Reverend Davis to learn from her husband. I'm sure, I am sure, she found such a suggestion humorous as she was single and had no man. (laughs) Would any of us dare to take a guess at why, why in 2023, women and people of differing gender are not full and equal partners with their male-bodied colleagues in the work of the gospel? The Apostle Paul for sure is in part to blame. But it's also true that women were the first to announce the resurrection. But the men dismissed their talk as, I quote, idle chatter. Perhaps the patriarchy that still exists in the church today has its roots in a story of origin, one that goes almost all the way back to uh, in the beginning. Now, as all of us know, there are two creation stories in the first three chapters of Genesis. Story number one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The story is a six day, not 24-hour day, chronicle of creation with humankind, people of every gender, being created in God's wondrous image. That's on the final day, 
before God takes a well-deserved Sabbath rest. Come to think of it, there's a certain grace to that Sabbath rest, I think. Rest is a grace that redeems our story. The next creation story is so popular, I imagine all of us could tell it without so much as having to look. The characters are God, Adam, Eve, and a serpent. The context, a garden. The plot, eat anything you wish except from that tree or you'll die that very day. But the humans eat. Actually, Eve eats and gives some to her man. And that's how sin, evil, and death entered the world. That's how the story goes, right? Or, or is that what we have been told and have chosen to believe without engaging, interrogating, and interpreting the story for ourselves? The Reverend Dr. Cody Sanders, a Bright Divinity School alumnus and pastor of the old Cambridge Baptist Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I cannot imagine pastoring there because several members of the Harvard Divinity School faculty are affiliated with his congregation. I've never thought I had it so good. But he says of this story, that the creation story was written by men as a patriarchal narrative that blames women for the hardship of illness and laborious toil in a community that knew the difficulty of working the land, often under harsh conditions for everyday life. We can't make any excuses about it. It's simply the fact of the matter. Women had no hand in writing the story, nor formally interpreting the story for hundreds and hundreds of years. Once we can see that from the get-go that this is a patriarchal narrative that is intended to place the blame on women for the harshness of life, then we can begin to see the narrative itself does not always succeed in doing that. There are repressed narratives that puncture the dominant narrative from time to time. If if you and I can come to the text with fresh eyes, if we can read again, but as if for the very first time, if we can take Scripture seriously, which is always more consequential than taking Scripture literally, then we may find this narrative to be a redeeming story. So, will you with me, and will we together with God's Spirit, risk a bit of biblical and theological rehabilitation We need to unlearn and let go of what we have brought to this story. First, there is nothing whatsoever in this story about sin, transgression, evil, or the fall. Not one thing. Now, Take a show of hands. How many of you believe what I just said? I didn't think so. I think I just got your attention instead. What I just said goes against everything we've been taught and told, right? But the fall is not here or there. The fall would be a Pauline interpretation in the New Testament. Hebrew has several words for sin and transgression and fall, and not one of them is found in this story. Nor does the Hebrew Bible ever look back at this story for an explanation of original sin. That would be Augustine, an early church theologian. Sin does not occur in the garden 
sin is simply not there. Though Eve isn't really ever mentioned again beyond Genesis chapter 4, she does loom large in the Christian collective conscience for the origin of evil. And I would wager my bottom dollar that most of the patriarchs of early Christianity and the very religious persons of denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention have Eve in mind when they forbid women serving in leadership and exile churches for daring to follow the wise spirits leading when the church ordains those whom God has called. So, if this story isn't about sin or the fall, then what is it about? Well, we could wrestle with that question for an eternity. And wrestling with questions could, could leave us with a limp. But I expect that every time we wrestle with questions, doubts, and uncertainties, every time we contend with God, we may limp, yes, as a result of the encounter, but more than that, we will emerge with a blessing, wisdom, and grace that redeems our story. But some theology. There are two characters we need to know, Julian of Eclinum and St. Augustine. We've heard probably of the latter, but never ever the former. So here's the Reader's Digest version of these two theologians who were contemporaries during the 4th and 5th centuries of the Common Era. First, Julian of Eclinum was, by all accounts, a happily married man. Augustine, on the other hand, had one shame-inducing sexual encounter and was celibate from that point forward, which just goes to show us that shame is among the greatest adversaries to God's purposes in the world. Shame is antithetical to the grace of God. Augustine's interpretation of this Genesis story is where we get the idea of original sin. He deemed desire as sinful, something to be tamed and not a gift from God. The first humans creating clothing was to hide their bodies and to inhibit their desire, Augustine thought. Now, in contrast, Julian of Eclinum understood desire or natural appetite as simply one of God-given bodily senses. Therefore, desire didn't originate from human sinfulness. Against Augustine's view that all human nature was ever after changed by Adam's sin, Julian argued that human nature, including sexual desire, does not change since God bestows our essential human constitution. Julian of Eclinum, sex is a gift from God. Augustine, avoid it like the plague. Come on, folks, who would you choose? Augustine argued that the result of the fall was death. Julian said death was a natural part of life. From dust we were created. From the humus of the earth we were formed. Into the humus of earth we shall return. It's natural, not sinful, not shameful. So guess who won that theological fight? Guess who was excommunicated? Guess who was voted to not be in friendly cooperation with the capital C church? And guess whose views became standard orthodoxy for almost two millennia now? But there's another story at work within Genesis. Within this story of the woman and her man, a subversive story that can rise through the centuries of muck and mire layered upon it. If we let this parable fall fresh upon our ears and it becomes for us refreshing, 
We may, we may find this narrative to be a redeeming story, but it's going to take some work. It is, it is true that the man was created first, Ha-Adam, human, from which we get the name Adam. Yes, the sovereign God did tell the man from every tree of the garden, you, singular, may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you, singular, shall not eat, for in, for in the day that you, singular, eat from it, you, singular, shall surely die. The woman, whose name we don't yet know, is equal to the man. For those of us growing up hearing the rib story and thinking that men have one less rib than women, let's get serious. Just go get an x-ray. <laughs> also, it's strange, isn't it, that biblical translators use rib here and only here, whereas everywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, the word is translated side. When the word for rib is properly translated as side, we see equality, not hierarchy. But then there's a serpent. Like, how did it get in here? I, I, I don't know, but let's be clear about one thing before we take another step. The serpent is not Satan. Satan doesn't appear in this story. A serpent does. Apparently, the serpent is intelligent, and I can only speak my, for myself, and not, not for you, but I cannot imagine anything worse than a serpent with naked intelligence that has the ability to speak. <laughs> but I, I digress. The serpent does twist God's command to the man, which the woman never heard the woman doesn't know good and evil or sin. And yet that intelligent serpent inquires, Indeed, did God say, You too shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, From the fruit of any tree in the garden we may eat, though of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat and shall not touch it, lest you too die. And then that intelligent, sly, speaking serpent said to the woman, you too will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you too will be like God, knowing both good and evil. How is this text then about sin? If no one, not even God, has talked about sin. How can one sin if sin is not at all in the text? All the woman knows is that God had told the man, don't eat or you die. Not that eating is bad. Never said that. Not that death is bad. Never said that. It's a simple action and consequence statement. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her man who was with her and he ate. Did you hear that? Wisdom, the very characteristic that the fruit was to provide, that characteristic is lauded throughout the entire Hebrew Bible, from Solomon all the way through the prophets, and then in the New Testament to Jesus. Wisdom is to be desired, sought after. The only thing that the woman is guilty, if we we can use that word here, of is desiring what men are praised for from here on out. Even scripture itself, Proverbs 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever else you get, get wisdom. So the woman's desire of wisdom 
is not sinful, but good, praiseworthy. Here's something else. Wisdom in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Sophia, like the maternal character on the Golden Girls. (laughs) Sophia translates as wisdom. And everywhere it appears in Scripture, wisdom is feminine. So if wisdom is feminine, no wonder so many men are afraid of it, especially when women possess it. God forbid they desire it. But here's another question. Those humans took a bite, they ate it, and guess what did not happen? They did not die. The lack of immediate and sudden death raises questions for us. Lots and lots of questions. Like, the serpent was right. Which raises at least one more difficult question for us. Was God wrong? What did the serpent know that God did not? What other questions come to mind for you? For us? Who tells the truth in this story? The serpent? Or God? If we think that, oh, the humans, they will eventually die, just not yet. Well, that is not in the story either. There is nothing to suggest that these humans were created immortal. The woman is not sentenced to death. In fact, later, after our scripture reading ends, she is given a name, Eve which translates as the mother of all the living. God does banish them from the garden. God is perturbed. Sure. Okay. But let's take this a step further. God had promised sure and sudden death, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, they're banished from the garden. That's true. But God doesn't kick them out as if to say, oh, good luck, kids. Now you're on your own. Go get them. God goes with them. God never leaves them. So maybe this is the first text in which God changes God's mind, in which God had said there would be death but instead preserves life. God repents from what God had planned to do. God goes with them. Not only that, God sews garments for them like the seamstress God is. What sense would it make if God had stayed alone in that garden of paradise? Before God evicts the humans from the garden, God makes clothes for them. God knows how the world can be. We need some clothes, some nourishment for protection. We have been told that God is immortal, invisible, only wise, unchanged, and unchanging still, but... This inaugural story seems to disclose a God that responds to the agency of human beings. Perhaps God discovers grace in this story to redeem the story. After the two humans are expelled, Eve conceives by the help of God, mind you, not her man, She, the mother of all who live, gives birth to a son, Abel. Then, only in chapter 4, verse 7, does sin enter the story. A choice between life and well-being for another. 
or death and violence against one's fellow creature. Cain chooses the sin of death and violence against his brother, and that's the origin of sin in this narrative, not eating the fruit. Somehow, the murder and violence of another did not become original sin, but rather a woman's desire for wisdom did. Imagine the consequences that has cost the church, and cost us still. So this creation story, this story of a woman and her man, is not, it's not about sin. But it is about grace. The grace of God that creates a beautiful garden. The grace of God that will not let God abide by the rules that God had previously set The grace of God that follows us all the days of our lives, no matter what. The grace of God that meets us where we are and does not leave us where it found us. Grace redeems your, my, our story. Every story. And... You know what's so amazing about grace that redeems our story? That grace always leads us toward home. Home with God. Home where we are safe, loved, welcome, and wanted. Amen.
at this table, beloved, we find both bread and wine. But more than that, we find grace, amazing grace, grace that redeems our story. And once our story has been redeemed by God, there is nothing, nothing that we cannot do. Let us join our elder in prayer. Almighty God, whose presence is ever near to those who turn to you in prayer, we are grateful that we may come together this morning in your house to break bread in Christ's name. As we go through this Lenten season, we ask for your guidance, not that we may avoid temptation and struggle, but that you help us to open ourselves to blessing and insight through prayer, study, and reflection. Fill us with your strength to reduce, reduce, resist the seductions of our foolish desires and vain delights, that we may, may, may walk in obedience and righteousness, rejoicing in you with an upright heart, as we partake of the bread representing the broken body of Christ. Help us to create room in our hearts to work for justice and peace while growing in your love as we partake of the cup representing Christ's blood shed for our salvation, help us to grow in our understanding of your will. As we share this meal this morning, may your spirit go to work in our hearts to clear the clutter and chaos so that we might find space to ponder the significance of this Lenten season. Amen. On the night Jesus met with his disciples in an upper room, First, washed his hands, and then looking upon the table, he found gifts of both grain and grape. And taking the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and said, This is my body given for you. Take, eat, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks for it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we participate in the grace of God that redeems our story. Come, beloved, you are welcome and wanted here. Everything is ready.
As a church, we are witnesses to the grace of God that redeems our story. And if you would like to participate in this grace that is making itself known from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth, if you would like to unite with this church in a formal way, then I invite you to come forward as we together stand and sing our hymn of discipleship, There is a Line of Women. Beloved of God, our worship is nearing its conclusion, but our participation in the mission of God, it never, ever ends. So, come on, let's go from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth to make a plain declaration and a public demonstration of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. May we remember that we are never, ever very far from God's heart. 
And finally, finally, may we trust with all that we have and all that we are that the future God wants and ultimately will have is here and now, even as it is still on its way. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.